So shall we begin the session by Janusz Kolar, Professor Janusz Kolar? So let me uh, mention a little bit about his uh, uh, career. He began his uh, study uh, at the uh, um, Utrecht uh, <laughs> University in uh, Hungary. He spent some time uh, in Moscow and moved to uh, uh, Brandeis University in a rather dramatic way uh, for graduate study. And he got his PhD in 1984 uh, uh, under Professor Matsusaka. And uh, uh, he was a junior fellow at Harvard University from uh, 84 to 87. And uh, he was a professor at the University of Utah from uh, 87 to 99. And he's uh, currently a professor at Princeton University. Uh, well, all these are in... Uh, in Wikipedia. <laughs> Let me uh, mention one episode. Uh, so he's, uh, uh, in 1981, I met uh, his advisor, uh, Matsaka, and uh, he was excited and mentioned that he got uh, a splendid student, and he wanted, to meet, uh, he wanted me to meet him, and that's how I met him, and uh, when, when I met him, he gave me uh, one remark uh, about my paper. And that astonished me. <laughs> and so uh, I had to put it uh, in my contribution to the ICM uh, article. And uh, I have to say that that was the best part of my <laughs> article. And uh, so uh, that way, uh, uh, in higher dimensional uh, birational algebraic geometry, he has been and will be the, the leader. And uh, uh, as well as academic excellence, uh, uh, he has served IMU. For instance, we saw that his name appeared in the, the field uh, uh, committee uh, that uh, two days ago in the opening ceremony. So, please. Thank you very much, Professor Mori. Thank you. And so, I would like to tell you about the, about the structure of algebraic varieties. So this is meant as, meant as an introductory talk. For any technical details, you should lo look at my, uh, at my paper in the ICM volume. And I would like to thank especially Jennifer Johnson and Shandor Kovac for helping me to prepare this, this presentation. And so the story starts long ago. Uh, most likely the real starting point is Euler in in 1751, and he started to look at elliptic integrals. And, and here is one of the simplest elliptic integrals. And this is a multi-valued integral, and this causes various problems. And so then uh, uh, people said, sort of, it, it became standard with Euler, Abel, and then Jacobi, that we would like to make this integral single-valued. And so what they did, they looked at the algebraic curve C that's defined by the equation y squared equals x cubed plus ax squared plus bx plus c. Uh, let, let's look at this now as, uh, as a subset of C2. And now, you, the, the, and then instead of, of you view x as just in the one-dimensional complex like line, uh, we can view the points as on this algebraic curve, and there visibly, this expression under the, the square root just becomes y. So that means that this integral, that used to be a multi-valued integral, then becomes a single-valued integral. We just need to integrate dx over y. So now the pass we have to pay is that we integrate not just on the line, but at some pass on this algebraic curve. Okay. Uh, so then in general, if you have any polynomial g of x, y, then we can say that it implicitly determines y as a function of x. And so then if h, u, v is an any function, typically we are interested in it can be a polynomial or maybe a meromorphic function. Uh, then this multi-valued integral, when into h I substitute x and y as a function of x, by the same trick, 
we can make it into a single valued integral, so as the integral of h of x, y, y dx. But again, the pass, uh, again, the price we have to pay is that here, the, the, the pass of integration is on the algebraic curve that's defined by g. And so the curve is then the set of all points x, y that satisfy the equation g of x, y equals zero. And, uh, the, the, and uh, gradually, the interest shifted studying not the integrals for their own sake, uh, but these algebraic uh, right curves. And so, well, let's see an example of an algebraic curve. The equation is here, y squared equals x plus one squared times x times one minus x. And if, if you graph it, it for, for x, y real valued, then you get this picture. And so now from the real picture, it seems that, that you are defining two objects, that you are defining a point on the left, and there is this more or less egg shape, shape oval on the right. And so, uh, but in fact, the correct picture is, and this is very frequent in algebraic geometry, that you can make a very nice real picture, but it's frequently misleading. And you should really try to understand the complex picture behind it, which is much harder because even for the plane curves, it sits inside C2, which is like R4. And so here is a, here's a reasonably, reasonably honest rendering of the complex X picture that you can Think of it as the real plane that's the that reddish dark. And the whole slide, you can think of it as the complex plane. And then the algebraic curve is, is this blue shape. You can think of it as a pinched torus in the e imaginary a a exhibition. There is a picture of it. It's called, called, I believe, a croissant there. And so, so you get this shape, and now you see that it has only one part, and the, and the reason the real part seem to decompose because we intersect this pinch torus uh, with, with a, a, a plane. So what used to be just a point, in fact, it was a hint that there is a singularity on this surface there, whereas the other part is nice, smooth, and the real picture revealed the, the, the smoothness of it. Okay, and so now then if we, uh, now then another problem that they dealt with a lot is substitution into integrals. And so we, we teach usually more transcendental substitutions, but there was a lot of interest in algebraic substitutions. And uh, this led to two very basic questions. And so the question one is the equivalence question of algebraic curves. That if you have two algebraic curves, C and D, then uh, uh, we would like to know when we can uh, make some nice substitution which transforms the integrals over the curve C into integrals, oh, the integrals over d. And hopefully we can go here backwards and, and forwards. The other question uh, that came up is the simplest form. So now you, you know that, uh, the, that the various algebraic curves can be transformed into each other by these substitutions. And the integrals, integrals, they can be transformed into each other. Then you would like to, to find the simplest of these algebraic curves. So ideally, you would like to make a substitution that simplifies the curves as much as possible. And it is in this setting, or maybe he also had some other questions in, in mind that led to, to Riemann's fundamental contribution, but let's see an example first. So if we go back to the algebraic curve we have, the, 
that C y square equals x plus one square times x times one minus x, then if you stare at this a little bit, well, maybe you have to stare a little hard to see that you can do this substitution, x equals one over one minus t squared and y equals t times two minus t squared over one minus t squared squared, and it has an inverse t just y over x times x minus one. And uh, th th that achieves the nice trick that the integrals over this rather complicated algebraic curves, they, they just become ordinary one variable integrals. And so here uh, we achieved very successfully the simplification. We had a complicated algebraic curve and then we ended up uh, with just an ordinary one variable integral I like to think of it as the simplest algebraic curve. You can think of it as just a line, but eventually we will think of it as in fact the Riemann sphere. We would like to, to compactify C into the Riemann sphere, Riemann sphere CP1. And it's in this context that led to one of Riemann's fundamental theorems in 1851. So he asked himself, well, how much can we simplify an algebraic curve and, and exactly what can we achieve? So he says that if we have any algebraic curve, C inside C2, no matter, no matter how complicated these singularities are, uh, there are two simplifications that we can achieve. And so, uh, so Riemann says that that there's a compact Riemann surface. And so one simplification is that here we ended up with a compact object, which will be very, very helpful in the future. And the other is that he removes the singularities, that the compact Riemann surface locally lo looks just like, like C. So the singularities are removed and we compactify the object. And moreover, what's an extra uh, bonus that this compact Riemann surface is unique, and uh, that there's a meromorphic and invertible map between this compact Riemann surfaces C, which establish an isomorphism between the meromorphic function theory of the algebraic curve C and the meromorphic function theory of the compact Riemann surface S. Okay? And so uh, the, 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 this isomorphism is completely obvious when if there's a meromorphic function on C, you can just come propose it, 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 it with phi and you get a meromorphic function of S and conversely you can use just, just phi inverse. Now, in some sense, sense, it is a theorem like this, that's the aim of the higher dimensional structure theory of algebraic varieties. But it took some time to, to, to find it. So this is the, then what we call the minimal model program. So we start with any algebraic variety X. I will explain what an algebraic variety is, so you don't have to worry about it now. Then the, the Question is, is there an other algebraic variety, X sub M? M is for minimal, such that these two varieties, they have the same meromorphic function theory. So there's a natural way to go between meromorphic functions of X and meromorphic functions of, on X M. And we would like the geometry of X M to be the simplest possible. And so in Riemann's case, he has a simplification that was achieved that that he created something that's, that's compact and something smooth, and for curves, this was unique. Uh, now, so the answers that we have uh, to start for curves, I already mentioned that the, that was proved by Riemann, and it took quite some time to figure out what to do with algebraic surfaces, so there is this very unfortunate term in knowledge that we like to count complex dimensions. So for us, a Riemann surface is an algebraic curve. So when I say something is a surface that is locally like C2. So 
I, it is not my invention. It was first put in reasonably complete form by end requests and then completed by Kodaira in 1966. And then not much happened after that um, until 1981 when, when Professor Mori came up with a program to do something similar in higher dimension. And so this is now called Mori's program or minimal model program. And there are many important results, but also many open questions that, that are still ahead. Okay. Now, also I would like to mention the, the moduli problem of algebraic varieties. I will not say too much more about this in this, this talk, but in the written version I, I wrote quite a lot about it. And so, so far we were asking about one particular algebraic variety. How can we simplify it? But you see an algebraic variety, if you think of it as given by equation, then you can vary the coefficient in the equation and you get the, get the families of algebraic varieties. And so you may also ask yourself, you want to simplify not just one variety, but you want to understand the simplest families of algebraic varieties. So again, it's not clear what the right notion of the simplest family is. And then, if you find the right notion, you might ask yourself, well, how can we transform any family into one of the simplest list? families. Here work started relatively late, so for, for, for curves, for one curves, Riemann already, already solved the problem in 1851, but for families of curves, the solution was found only in 1969, and an important paper of Deling and, and Mumford, and then for surfaces, as a consequence of the minimal model, the program uh, with Shepard Baron, I, I wrote up a solution and then it was extended a lot by Alexev in 1996. And it seems that in higher dimension, this method is now frequently called the KSBA method. It works. There are are various technical details that have not been completely settled yet, but, but uh, main theory is definitely there. Okay, so now instead of just running ahead, well, let's, let's pause a little bit and see what is an algebraic variety after all. Well, and so the easiest is to define an affine algebraic set which is just the common zero set of a bunch of polynomials. And from now on, we will work always uh, with, with complex numbers. And if you don't like several polynomials, you like just hypersurfaces, just one equation for pretty much everything I do in this talk, that's already complicated e e e enough. So if you like to to things with hypersurfaces. All of the examples I will have will in fact be, be hypersurfaces. Well, I mentioned already that we like to count complex dimensions, so this is one half of what you would say the usual topological dimension of the object. And so then in low dimensions we have, we have curved surfaces and threefolds and so on. Okay, now what are algebraic varieties? So, so far we define affine algebraic sets, and then I would like to, to, def to define this by an example. For instance, let's look at this equation. I'm sure that by now several of you worked out, but at least the real picture. So, it, the complex picture is a bit harder to see, but this is the real picture. Now then if you look at it, then you say, well, that it seems that there is a sphere there and then there's a cone. And so why do we get seemingly these, these two parts? Well, 
And the answer is given by, you can notice that the equation I wrote down, it in fact factors. So it's the product of two degree two polynomials, where then the first one is the sphere, which is still blue, and the second one is a cone, uh, which is red. And so that means that the original equation, it somehow, that was needlessly complicated. It really is just the union of two basic objects, the sphere and the cone. And so then these are the algebraic varieties, the algebraic sets that cannot be decomposed in any, any sort of reasonable way. Now, of course, if someone just looks at the real picture of the cone, then you might say that it has two parts, yeah? that it has sort of the left half cone and the right half cone, and, but that's just to mislead you because in the complex picture, it's in fact just one irreducible object. So you can not write the left side of the cone just by algebraic equation. And so then when I say variety, you should think of it as, a, as an algebraic set that cannot be decomposed any, any Further, so these are really the basic building blocks. Now, but these varieties are, are not compact. Well, if you look at the previous picture, well, well, there was the there was the sphere, the cone. The cone is clearly not compact, but in fact, the complex sphere is also not compact. So, so it's again here the real picture is is misleading, but to to compactify algebraic varieties, we have to introduce the complex projective space that was already mentioned in the lecture of Professor Huang. On the complex projective space, we have only homogeneous coordinates. So the coordinates of a point are not well defined, only well defined up to multiplying by a, a scalar. So then a consequent of this that I cannot evaluate a polynomial at a point of complex projective space. There is one exception where I can nearly do the evaluation. If P happens to be homogeneous of degree D, then I can take lambda out as lambda to the D. Now this is still not quite well defined, but it leads to two well defined notion. So the zero set of a homogeneous polynomial is then, then well defined and that factor lambda to the d does not change the, the question whether the number after it is zero or not. And more in, and also importantly, the, the, the quotient of two homogeneous polynomials of the same degree, that's a well defined function because then that lambda to the, the d cancels out. So then this way I get some rational functions, and these are then nice meromorphic fig, fig functions. And so, yeah, so it says that. So then I have the notion of rational functions of CPN, and then I can restrict them to a subvariety inside CPM, sort of as long as the subvariety is not contained in the zeros or the poles, I can restrict and, and I get rational functions on CPM. Now I think that this definition probably would have seemed completely natural to Euler and Gauss, but to modern sensibilities it's very, very strange. We e, e, expect some manifold theory to start with local definitions like what a topological space is or what a differentiable manifold is. No one defined this by embedding it into some Rn or Cn. And, uh, but in algebra e e e geometry, somehow we do not gain anything by the local definition. And this is, is shown by a fundamental theorem that was was proved, so probably the form stated here, here it's already proved by, by Chow, but then considerably extended by Sarah in 1956. So if I have a closed subset of CPN, 
that is locally can be defined by a bunch of analytic functions, then the first claim is that in fact it is algebraic. So that means that it can globally be defined as the common zero set of homogeneous polynomials. And the <laughs> second, that every meromorphic function on M is rational. And so there, there, there are then two homogeneous polynomials of the same degree such that the quotient restricts when restricted to M gives exactly this homogeneous, uh, this, this meromorphic fig function. And so somehow if you are working on, on compact complex uh, objects, then, then, you, then you have to do algebraic geometry. Now you, you can think about, the, think about this non-example here where the, 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 where the graph of the sine function, where inside C2, that's, you know, that's nicely defined by just y equals sine x, and it's definitely locally defined by an analytic thick function, where it is not defined by a polynomial, but what happens is that if you close this graph up at infinity, you get some really Really, really horrible looking space. So near infinity, the closure of the graph cannot be, def be defined by an analytic tick function. Okay, so then, now you, you can use these, these rational uh, functions which are the same as meromorphic functions. I will probably use these, these names interchangeably to define what a map of an algebraic where, Right. At least we start with rational map. Uh, we start with a bunch of rational uh, f functions, and if I evaluate them, well, then I get, get the M plus one point, so it's a point in CPM. Okay, so then, so the, these are the rational uh, maps. Now, there's one interesting feature. You might want to know where such a map is defined. Well, so, First, if you just look at the definition, then you say that we should stay away the poles of the individual F sub i's. That's completely clear. Now, we also have to stay away from the common zero because in complex projective space, I do not have a point where all of the coordinates are zero. And so that means we have to leave out quite a lot of points. But remember that in projective space, Pace, the, the coordinates of a point are not uniquely defined. And so to see an example, well, let's just look at this map. But if you think about it, this will be the projection of CP2 to CP1 from just one point. But here it is given explicitly. I send a point with coordinates x, y, z to the pair x over z and y over z. And then if you look at this, you say, well, this is not defined when z equals zero. On the other hand, using this, uh, this non-uniqueness, if I look at x over z and y over z, what I can do? Well, I can multiply through here both coordinates by z and divide by y. So that means that this is the same point as that has coordinates x over y comma one. Now you see from here that whether z is zero or not does not matter as far as it's defined. The only thing you need that y shouldn't be zero. And then I can also uh, rewrite it as one comma y over x. So we see from this that uh, the, the, the only thing that goes wrong if both x and y uh, are zero. And so, so that means that the rational map is it, almost always defined on a larger set than you first think, and it might be actually somewhat hard to figure out where such a map is defined. Okay, now this leads us to the notion of isomorphism, but this is exactly what you would expect from any background. Two varieties are isomorphic if there are everywhere defined maps between them that are inverses of each other. And so isomorphic varieties are essentially the, 
the same I don't, so, so, so there's nothing surprising there. There is another notion called birational equivalence, which is unique to algebraic geometry. Okay? So the definition is two varieties, they are birational. If there are just rational maps, so they don't have to be everywhere defined, and in fact, in fact typically neither F nor G is everywhere defined, well, such that I can write it two ways. So the, the first definition says that the obvious way of composing function establishes an equivalence between the meromorphic function theory of X and the meromorphic function theory of Y. So this is what Riemann achieved with his compact the Riemann surface is the equivalence of meromorphic theory. Now, then the other form that's, that's quite useful, that there are some smaller dimensional now closed algebraic sub-varieties, Z inside X and W inside Y, such that the complements, they are isomorphic as, by this time, non-compact algebraic varieties, okay? And so that is actually the, uh, a, a quite useful notion in algebraic geometry is denoted by this birational over uh, uh, tilde. Okay, so th then I have this non-example from topology that if you start from top top topology, if if I manage to to push this uh, this button right, then you will see that you can cut a sphere into several parts and assemble out of it a sphere and a, and a, a to so you can do this in topology, but something similar can never be done in algebraic geometry. So let's see if I succeed with this. Okay, so I succeeded of doing it. Okay, and so in algebraic geometry, you cannot do this. So, so it's a nice picture, but it's still a non-example from topology. Okay, now maybe it's more in interesting to see an actual example of birational equivalence. So I start with the affine surface, easier to write down equations with affine, just x, y equals z cubed. And my claim is that it's birational to, to C2 with coordinates u and v, and I have here the actual maps. So on one way I start with x, y, z, just maps to x over z, y over z, and to come back from uv, I get u square v, e, uv squared, and uv. You can easily see that they are inverses of, of each other. And now since I map to C2, not Cp1, this f is in fact not defined when z equals zero. Now this g is everywhere defined, but the two coordinate axes are mapped to just one point. So you see that it's definitely not an isomorphism, but it turns out to be that if you leave out the z equals zero from S and the two coordinate axes from C2, then you, you get an isomorphism, okay? So, so this is the typical uh, e, e, uh, example of what happens. And the basic rule of thumb in higher dimensional birational uh, geometry is that many questions about an algebraic variety X can be answered by first studying the same question on some other variety that is birational to it, and then we answer a similar question on the lower dimensional algebraic like set Z and W. Now one complication is that Z and the W are typically much more complicated than X. So if I start with smooth varieties X and Y, usually Z and the W are more complicated, but in many cases we gain enough by knowing that they have lower dimension that in fact this, this helps us. 
So then the, uh, the, this is now the main aim of the minimal model program. It's a, it, it's, uh, it's not really something thing fixed, but you can say that if you have an algebraic variety and you have a question, then you would like to find some variety y that's birational to x that is best adapted to studying the question. And the y you need to, to choose that will change by the question. And so it's not that there is just one thing that's, that's uh, best, but really there's a method that, uh, that, that you can run that, construct, that, that constructs in many cases this y that, that, that should help you a lot. I'm not claiming that this solves every question, but it solves a lot of the questions that were out. And now then there is the technical part that you have to set up some dimension induction to deal with the lower dimensional varieties. Okay. Now, of course, then you ask yourself, when is a variety uh, simple? So I would like to transform a complicated varieties, the variety into a simpler varieties. So f for surfaces, the answer was worked out by by Castelnuovo and and requests between 1898 and 1914. I think the basic setup of the theory was really done in these in these years. And then in higher dimension, uh, not much happened. And so there wasn't even a, a conjecture around what the simplest varieties should be. Uh, until the 1980s when Mori and Reed came up with the minimal um, model program, sort of that settled it for one class of varieties and for another class of varieties, the, but we believe the correct answer was, was given in, in 1992. And I would like to, to, to explain these details to you. Now, to say when a variety is uh, simple, it's a little bit, bit complicated. We need the notion of the canonical class or, or, or the first turn class. And so I, I hope many of you are familiar at some level with the first turn class. It, it just says that, that there is some way to associate a number to any algebraic curve that's contained in a variety X. I will explain two ways of associating this number because it is, it is important and it's, and it's very helpful. And if you come from topology or differential geometry, you like to denote this number, the integral over the curve of some objects that's called the first turn class, if you come from algebraic variety, then you, then you say that is this intersection number of the canonical class and the curve C. And there is this unfortunate minus sign in, in between them. It comes because differential geometers, they prefer to work with the tangent bundle, whereas algebraic geometers prefer to work with the cotangent bundle. So there is many formulas, there is a minus, minus sign between them. Now to understand how to the, the find this notion, let's get back that if you have just a measure or a volume form in R and what you would like to integrate, it's something, some function times dx1 wedge and so on dxn. Now we like to do some complex geometry, so we like to use Thing that, that, that a complex like, volume form, so locally it's written as some function times dz1 as dzn. Now, this is not really a volume form, that to get some volume form, you have to take this omega wedge omega bar. And then there's another sign issue here that I don't want to, to spend some time on, but we would like to work uh, this complex volume form. Now the big tangent in the theory comes from the fact that differential geometers, they very strongly prefer C infinity volume forms. So that locally defined 
coefficient function they have, they would like them to be C infinity function. Whereas algebraic and analytic geometers, they want these functions to be meromorphic. So that's, that's what they like. Now there is one class of varieties where you can achieve this simultaneously, that's the class of Calabiao varieties. It's an important but, uh, but, but small subclass. In general, we have to, to find some connection between these two. And the connection between these two is given by the classical gauss bonnet theorem. So if I have a smooth projective variety, and let's assume that someone picks a C-infinity volume form and also a meromorphic big volume form, and let's see what can I do with any algebraic curves. Then the differential geometer would consider the Cherf form or the Ricci form that comes out of this. It is this expression. It, I will not use exactly what it is, so it doesn't uh, matter too much if you don't want to remember. And an algebraic geometer, well, since, since we're algebraists, we are more simple-minded, we just, we just count. So then I just look at this omega m, I count the number of zeros of this on the curve C and subtract from this the number of poles. So they're both counted with, with multiplicity. So we have these, these two notions, and then the gauss bonnet theorem is, that if I look at the, the, the churn form and if I integrate it on the curve C, then I do get a number. And this will be the same as the algebraic degree. Again, there is this minus sign here. And so in, in particular, both sides are independent of the choice of the C infinity or the meromorphic volume force. And so this way, I get an integer that's associated to a curve C. And so this will, I will denote the integral of, over C of, of C1 of x. Okay, and so now at least I can tell you the three, three basic building blocks of algebraic varieties. So there are the negatively curved varieties uh, where the integral of the churn form on every curve is negative. And so this is the largest class of the C. Then there is the flat, also called Kralabiau, where this integral is always zero. So these have an especially important role in string theory and mirror symmetry. And then there are the positively curved varieties, also called Fano varieties, because, because systematic investigation of them was started by Fano in the 1920s in the three-dimensional case, where this integral is always positive. It turns out that this is the smallest class, but this is the one that appears especially frequently in, in applications, okay? Now, uh, so there's also one big theory, there's the theory of Kähler-Einstein matrix that you see that here, uh, yeah. instead of looking at these, these churn forms point-wise, I was just talking about the integral of it, of algebraic curves. And so the Kähler-Einstein theory asks not just that, for instance, in the first case, the integral be negative on every curve, but they would like to, uh, to, to achieve to find a form that's in fact point-wise negative. And so there has been a lot of, of uh, work there, but this is heavily analytic, so I don't want to, to, to talk about it, but somehow this is, is maybe that, that, uh, that, that explains why these classes are, are really that important. Now it turns out that the first two classes are, are basic, but the third is not. And, and this is really one thing that was responsible why the theory did not develop as early as possible because, because it just looked very nice that these three are the basic classes, but the third one 
one was not. Now, to understand all, all, all algebraic varieties, we have to understand two mixed types. Uh, the first one is semi-negatively curved, or the Kodaira Itaka type. This sort of mixes the, the two first classes together. We just assume that the, the, the integral of the transform on every curve is less than or equal zero, okay? And so now, one of the main open problems here is a structural conjecture that, that if I have a semi-negatively curved variety, then there's a unique and everywhere defined map from X to, to another variety, the IX, such that the, 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 the curves on which this integral is zero, they precisely sit in the fiber. So every curve in the fibers has integral zero, and the curves not contained in the fibers, they have strictly negative integral. And moreover, this target variety is negatively curved in a suitable sense. So the suitable sense, it's a, so it, it, it's not just a small change, but, 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 but it's reasonable, reasonable to, to think of it as negatively curved. Okay. Uh, now, I would like to call special attention to the intermediate cases where the dimension of the target is between zero and the dimension of x. It's because in this case, we get a very interesting structure theorem. So this map from x to ix, it will represent x as a family of lower dimensional Calabiau varieties. So the fibers, they are Calabiau, and they are parametrized by the lower dimensional variety ix. So uh, these things happen a lot in algebraic variety that we start with a variety, it has no structure, originally, and then we find that it has a completely canonical morphism to another variety. So we can, so that means if you understand the lower dimensional fibers and the lower dimensional target, then out of this we can hopefully assemble an understanding of the whole variety. This is one reason why the moduli like question is important. Now, then there's another mixed type, which is the positive fiber type. Now the definition I would like to tell you is the following, that there's a unique map from X to MX, such that if a curve is contained in the fiber, then this integral is positive, and this MX is semi-negatively curved. So I told you this is what I would like to tell you, but in fact, this is not the right definition. So that's, that's another uh, problem. So, but I think if you think that this is the right definition, you can, you can get the right picture, but, but, uh, but there's a serious technical uh, issue there. We will fix this definition later if I have time. So now let's, move ahead, assuming that this is the positive fiber type. So the main conjecture is that if we have any algebraic variety X that is birational to a variety X and that is either semi-negatively curved or has positive fiber type. So if you think of the positive fiber type that the the, 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 the integral of churn form is always larger or equal zero, then it's not true that we could transform algebraic variety, every algebraic variety, something that's either negatively curved or flat or, or, or positively curved, but sort of basically uh, we have achieved that every algebraic variety is transformed something that's either semi-negatively curved or semi-positively curved, okay? So, so again, this is not a, a completely correct statement, but so basically that's what we have achieved. Now this 
xm that we get is called the minimal model, especially in the first case, in the semi-negatively curved case. Now, there is one uh, big caveat that this xm may have singularities. This was a rather difficult point historically because because uh, one of the main simplifications that Riemann achieved was to uh, make algebraic curves smooth. And so there was a lot of resistance, uh, not, not, not really openly, but I think subconsciously among algebraic geometers to, to, to make varieties singular. The instinct was that the smooth varieties are the best and we should just stick with them. But in fact, it turns out that, that we should live with certain mild singularities. And so these, these varieties XM, they have some singularities that are reasonably, reasonably mild. They are completely understood in dimension three, and we know a lot about them in higher dimensions. But, but sort of, uh, this is it. Okay, well, let's see some, some history of this. And so, yeah, maybe they are better uh, visible up here. So, the first period is Enrique uh, and Kodaira, Enrique, who started the, the classification of surfaces and, and Kodaira, who essentially finished it in the 1960s. Then the big breakthrough in the 1980s is uh, Shigefumi Mori and, and Miles Reed. And then, then the last 10 years, the major work was done by Christopher Haken and James McKernan. And looking at this, you see that, that each step of development required one serious and one smiling mathematician's contribution <laughs> together. Okay. okay, well, so I see I still have a little more time, so I can go back and give the definition of the, the third class. Uh, of what the right definition is. And so the, the main thing is to understand what rationally connected varieties are. And, and the theme is that these are varieties that have plenty of rational curves. Uh, these again came up in the lecture of Professor Huang. He looked at the lowest degree rational curve, the simplest rational curves, which he called lines, whereas we would like to look at just all possible rational curves, and, and we would like to make sure that the variety has plenty of rational curves. So what does it mean to have plenty of rational curves? Well, there are various ways you can, can think about it. For instance, you can can require that through any two points there is a rational curve, the image of just CP1 to X. Or you can get somewhat greedier and say not just two points, say any number of points, you would like to find a rational curve that passes through them. Or you can get even greedier, but you might want to specify not just the, the points, but the tangent directions there. And it turns out to be that these are all equivalent to each other. And so once you can connect any two points by rational curves, then you can connect any 100 points by rational curve. You can specify the tangent directions. If you like to spe specify higher or their, their behavior, so the local Taylor expansions up to 100, uh, that's fine, you can do that. So this is really a nice class of algebraic varieties and, and these are the rationally connected varieties where there are these lots and lots of rational curves. And so, so, so here you have nearly as much, much flexibility with rational curves as you have in, in topology with just line, with, with just curves and, and circles. In topology, you have no 
problem drawing, uh, drawing a curve that passes through any number of points, and this is the class where you can do this with rational curves inside algebraic varieties. Now, it turns out to be there are lots of nice properties that rationally connected varieties have that you wouldn't have thought to, 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 to start with. So one of the basic is, well, the aim was to generalize the notion of, of positively curved, so we should at least, at least know that if something is positively curved, then it's rationally connected. And it's indeed true. Well, um, maybe I would like to point out there are also good arithmetic uh, properties. This is especially surprising, for instance, over a finite field where some important results of, of L and N O connect the arithmetic mathematic mod p of these varieties to the existence of rational curves in characteristic zero. And also there is an interesting result due to Lemper and Sabo, which says that the loop space of a rationally connected variety is also rationally connected. Of course, the loop space is a it's enough kind of a fresh manifold, so you have to, to define what rationally connected should be, but there's a natural well, definition there. And so, now, one of my favorite problems here is ask whether being rationally connected is a symplectic property or not. I don't want to def define it exactly, but if you look at an algebra, a, a, a variety that smooths, then of course it has an underlying topological manifold structure, but it turns out there is also a natural symplectic structure of it. And so then the question is, can you decide just by looking at the symplectic structure whether the algebraic variety that you see is rationally connected or not? So then finally we can end up the with the correct definition of the positive fiber type. So that is X has positive fiber type. If there's a unique, unique map from X to MX such that the fibers, they are rationally connected. So uh, at least the smooth fibers are, these maps can have some singular uh, fibers in, in its local dimension that, that, that are more complicated. At least we have to, to change the definition and that the target MX is semi-negatively curved. So I, I, I hope that I managed to provide, a, provide at least a good introduction to the notes I have in the volume. I hope everyone will rush out right now and just read it while these definitions are fresh in your mind. Thank you very much. Is there any questions? Ah, yes. So I wanted to ask you, like, uh, curiosity. I mean, you mentioned it uh, about this uh, Keller-Einstein uh, metric existence in the, in the positive uh, case is still open, while I sort of have heard that some people, Donaldson got a three million dollar prize for solving it, or what is my lack of information? And so, so he solved some very important questions there. So he proved that the existence of Kähler Einstein metric is equivalent to some other property. Case stability. Called case stability. But at least I don't believe that, that they know exactly which varieties have a, a Kähler-Einstein metric. So this case stability is a, a very efficient way to prove that something thing cannot have a Kähler-Einstein metric. But it, it, it is still pretty hard to check whether something is case stable or not. 
Then I have another question. If you take the product of a curve of higher genus times P1, where does it fit? And so it's a product of, 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 of what, a curve of higher genus? P1 times a curve of genus at least two. This is not a positive... Uh, uh, no, no, there's a positive fiber type. You just take the coordinate projection to the curve of higher genus, then the fibers are just CP1s, they are positive and the target is negatively curved. Yeah, but you, you wrote semi. Sorry? The target is negative, yes. Yeah, the target is, is negatively curved. I should have said maybe semi-negatively curved, the, the, the target, yes. Uh, any other question? So does solving the structural conjecture, does it completely characterize the birational geometry ca or can it be used to find another like bi birational invariant? So for example, in the curve case, the only birational invariant was the, the function field. For a higher dimension, are there any other birational invariants? And so if I understood uh, right, you are asking whether this solves all the questions. And the answer is no. And so there are, so uh, if you know these minimal models, they are, are v very good, especially when they are semi-negatively curved. And so then uh, they are, are almost unique, at least we understand exactly where the non-uniqueness come from and they contain a lot of information about the variety. These models are not as unique in the positive fiber type and there are some very, very basic geometric questions are still not known there. So, so this is a nice method that solves several problems, but, uh, but not everything. Uh, any other question? Maybe just uh, the only one more. Okay, so if not, let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>